Hello and welcome to this online lecture. My name is Patty Kokish and today we are be going to be covering some final exam review topics for your online Math 200 class. Now I want to stress that we're only going to cover chapter 9 and on. The rest of the chapters were already covered in the midterm exam review. You can find and watch that on the Ivy Tech YouTube channel. If you look for the midterm exam review, that was done um, the week of your midterm, so you can find it by that date. Um, so for your final exam, I would suggest watching this video along with the midterm um, exam review video for a complete final exam review. I also want to stress that this week you do have your final exam um, review homework due. I'm not sure if it's optional or not for your class, but please pay attention to that. And either way, I would highly recommend that you do it. Next week is finals week, so you will be required to go to your proctoring site to take your Math 200 final exam. So please make sure that you've done the review and prepared um, for that. So today, let's start with some topics. Um, we're not going to cover everything. There's simply not time. Um, but the way that I have it set up, we have a few different examples for each of the chapters and we cover off on the topics um, that I was able to find in your final exam review. So let's start with chapter nine, which is all about estimating the value of a parameter. So the this is normally found at the end of the section, but I just wanna talk through this. We're not going to cover all of this, but it is important to know what type of um, kind of a thing we're doing, okay? What formula we're going to use, um, how we should be approaching these problems. So the first question you wanna ask yourself is which parameter are we estimating? If you're estimating a proportion or P, um, provided that N times P hat times one minus P hat is at least 10, you can construct a confidence interval for P. Um, if you're estimating mu, your mean, um, you have to know if sigma is known or not. So if sigma is known, um, then you have to ask yourself, is n greater than or equal to 30? If it is, then you compute your z interval. If it's not, then you have to figure out if your data comes from a population that is at least approximately normal with no outliers. If not, then we have to use some kind of non-parametric methods, um, which you don't need to worry about. But if it is, then you go ahead and compute your z interval. If sigma is not known, so you don't know your standard deviation, if n is greater than or equal to 30, then you compute your t interval. But if not, then you have to figure out if your data comes from a normal a distribution that's uh, approximately normal, so a population that doesn't have any outliers, that sort of thing. If it doesn't, then you would have to uh, resort to non-parametric methods, which you don't need to worry about again. But if it is, then you go ahead and compute your t interval. I'm going to skip the standard deviation part since that's not covered in this class. So let's look at an example here. Um, so we have pennies minted after 1982. They're made up of 97.5% zinc and 2.5% copper. The following data represents the weights in grams of 17 of the randomly selected pennies after 1982. So these are all of the weights in grams for our 17 selected pennies. We're going to treat the data as a simple random sample and we want to estimate the population mean weight of pennies minted after 1982. So in order to do this, it should be pretty simple. All we have to do is add up all of our observations, our 2.46, 2.47, all the way on. And then we divide by the number of numbers that you have, which is 17. So this is our normal formula for finding mean. And we get 2.464. Always make sure that your answer makes sense for these. Okay, make sure that it's in the same ballpark of the numbers that you were just talking about. So the point estimate of mu is 2.464 grams. So this should be pretty easy for you by now. Now we want to construct a 1 minus alpha 100% confidence interval for mu. So it needs to be shown that the sample data comes from a simple random sample or a randomized experiment. The sample size is relatively small relative to the population size, less than 5%. And the data from a population that is normally distributed or the sample size needs to be large. So in order to construct a confidence interval, we take our x bar and we add and subtract our t alpha over two, which is our critical value with n minus one degrees of freedom times f over square root of n, where s is your sample standard deviation and n is your sample size. So in our case, we have our x bar, which is our, um, our mean that we just found, our 2.464. We subtract our critical value, which is 2.921. Um, you'd have to look that up on the table. You're gonna look that up um, on your, uh, your t distribution table. 
So in our case, we have, um, let's see, 16 degrees of freedom and we have um, 0 0.005. So if we navigate over to that, um, we get 2.921. The reason we look up 0 0.005 is because we want 99% confidence. So that means that our alpha is 0 0.01. If we divide that by two, as we should when we're doing a confidence interval, we get 0 0.005. So that's your critical value. 0 0.02 is the sample standard deviation. This can be calculated um, either in Excel, Minitab, or using your graphing calculator. And then we divide by the square root of 17. So we end up with um, a lower bound of 2.45 and an upper bound of 2.478. So in order to interpret this, we would say that we are 99% confident that the mean weight of pennies minted after 1982 is between 2.450 and 2.478 grams. Okay, in this section, we were also asked some questions where you have to actually go back and determine the sample size. So let's go back to the pennies, and let's say we want to figure out how large of a sample would be required to estimate the mean weight of a penny manufactured after 1982 within 0.005 grams with 99% confidence. We're going to assume that our sigma is 0 0.02. So in order to do this, we need some values first. We need Z alpha over two, which it's going to be the same alpha value, 0 0.01. So when we divide by two, it's 0 0.005. Um, if you look that up on your table, you get 2.575 for your Z value. Make sure you're looking at Z, not T. S is going to be 0 0.02. That's our sample standard deviation. The error that we're willing to deal with is 0 0.005 grams. So we plug it into this formula here, which make sure that when you're doing your problems, you're referencing your formula sheet so that you know exactly how to use it. Um, some of the formulas are provided to you, so make sure that you're comfortable with the ones that are so that you know how to use them. So we just plug in all of our values. We have 2.575 times our sample standard deviation of 0 0.02 divided by the error that we're willing to deal with, which is 0 0.005 grams. And we divide that first, and then we square our answer, and we get 106.09. Now, the important thing about sample size calculations is that you always need to round up. So it's impossible for us to sample 106.09 pennies. So that means we need to round up to the next one, because if we only sample 106 pennies, we're not going to quite have the accuracy that we desire. So when you're calculating sample size, you always need to round up. So ignore all of your rounding rules that you've learned in previous math classes. Okay, let's move on to some topics from chapter 10, which is all about hypothesis testing regarding a parameter. So again, I want to start with the end piece, which kind of walks us through what we do in certain situations. Um, I do want to point out that we only, in chapter 9, we only dealt with um, our formulas for mu. It is important that you still know your, um, your PE formulas as well for your proportion. So the first question you ask is, what parameter is addressed in the hypothesis? If it's a proportion, then you need n times p naught times 1 minus p naught to be at least 10, and use the normal distribution, where p hat is x over n, and you calculate your test statistic as p hat minus p naught divided by the square root of p naught times 1 minus p naught over n. Now, if you were um, trying to do a hypothesis test regarding um, the mean, then provided that the sample size is at least 30 or the data comes from a population that is normally distributed, you use the student's t distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. Your test statistic, t naught, is going to be x bar minus mu naught divided by s over square root of n where n is your sample size, and I'm going to skip um, the sample standard, or sorry, the standard deviation and variance. Okay, let's look at this example right here. So in 1997, 46% of Americans said that they did not trust the media when it comes to fairly reporting the news fully, accurately, and fairly. In 2007, a poll of 1,010 adults nationwide, 525 stated that they did not trust the media. At excuse me, at the alpha equals 0 0.05 level of significance, is there any evidence to support the claim that the percentage of Americans that do not trust the media to report fully and accurately has increased since 1997? So what we want to know is we want to know if our p-value, or sorry, not our p-value, scratch that, if our p is greater than 0 0.46, 
Um, so first, we must verify that the requirements to perform the hypothesis test are met. So it has to be a simple random sample, which it is. n times p naught times 1 minus p naught has to be at least 10, which in our case, our sample size is 1,010. Our p naught is 0 0.46, and um, then we have 1 minus 0 0.46. If we do this, we get almost 251. This is much larger than 10, so no issues there. And then it's also going to be true that our sample size is less than 5% of the population size. So our assumption of independence is also met. So step one is going to be to set up our null and our alternative hypotheses. So H naught is going to be that P equals 0 0.46 versus our alternative hypothesis, which is P greater than 0 0.46. Level of significance is typically given. In this case, it's alpha equals 0 0.05. Our sample proportion is calculated as the number of individuals with the characteristic that we're interested in, which was 525 divided by our total sample size, which is 1,010. So it's 0 0.52. So we calculate our test statistic as 0 0.52 minus 0 0.46. That was what we were interested in testing. And dividing by the square root of 0 0.46 times 1 minus 0 0.46 over our sample size, 1,010. And if we calculate that very carefully in your calculator, you will get 3.83. So there are two approaches here. You can either use classical approach or p-value. You can also use your calculator to perform these tests. Um, but I'm going to walk you through the p-value approach. So since this is a right-tailed test, the p-value is the area under the standard normal distribution to the right of the test statistic 3.83. And if you look this up on your table, it's very high. Our p-value is going to be somewhere around zero. So since our p-value is less than alpha, we do reject our null hypothesis. So our solution, our final kind of conclusion that we can make is that there is sufficient evidence at the alpha equals 0 0.05 level of significance to conclude that the percentage of Americans that do not trust the media to report fully and accurately has in fact increased since 1997. Okay, let's look at this one. Um, so that was one where we had a proportion. We're going to look at a mean one now. So let's assume that, that the resting metabolic rate, or RMR, of healthy males in complete silence is 5,710 kilojoules per day. Researchers measured the RMR of 45 healthy males who were listening to calm classical music and they found their RMR, or mean RMR, to be 5,708.07 with a standard deviation of 992.05. And we want to know at the alpha equals 0 0.05 level of significance, is there sufficient evidence to conclude that the mean RMR of males listening to calm classical music is different than the 5,710 kilojoules per day? So we're not trying to find out if it's less than, just different. So, um, for the solution, we're going to assume that the RMR of healthy males is 5,710 kilojoules per day. This is going to be a two-tailed test since we're just kind of looking to see if it's any different, not less or more. And since our sample size is quite large, we follow the steps for testing hypothesis about a population mean for large samples. Step one is to write our null and our alternative hypotheses. So our null hypothesis is that our mu is equal to 5710, and our alternative is going to be that the mu is not equal to 5710, so it's something different than that. Level of significance is alpha equals 0 0.05. Our sample mean, that was from our um, the sample that they took, was 5708.07, and the standard deviation was 992.05. So we calculate our test statistic by taking our X bar, which was 5708.07, subtracting our mu that we were um, initially thinking was the RMR for males, which was 5710, and dividing that by our sample standard deviation, which was 992.05 over the square root of N, which in our case we had 45 observations. And if you do this again very carefully, Make sure you put parentheses around your numerator, parentheses around your denominator, and you should get negative 0 0.013. Now, since this is a two-tailed test, the p-value is going to be the area under the t-distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. So we have 45 observations, so that means that we have 44 degrees of freedom. Um, and if we look to the left of negative t.025, 
um, equals negative 0 0.013 and to the right is 0 0.013. So that means our p-value is going to be two times that value. Um, so 0.5 is less than our p-value. So since the p-value is actually greater than the level of significance, um, since 0 0.05 is less than 0.5, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. So we would say that there is insufficient evidence or that there is not sufficient evidence at the alpha equals 0 0.05 level of significance to conclude that the mean RMR of males listening to calm classical music differs from 5710 kilojoules per day. So that means um, if we still think this is true, we would have to do another sample, um, possibly something with was done incorrectly with the sampling, but what it showed is that there is no difference in people listening to calm classical music versus others. Okay, one thing to talk about with this section is um, the fact that when large sample sizes are used on a hypothesis test, the results could end up being statistically significant, even though the difference between the sample statistic and the mean may have no practical significance. Large sample sizes tend to lead to this kind of issue where we have statistical significance but no practical significance. Um, one kind of good example is uh, diet pills. They tend to do really large samples um, so, that they're, so that they see a difference that kind of supports their diet pill. But the maybe the difference in the weight loss is only a pound over the course of two months, which obviously is not very much one pound. Um, so that would not be considered practically significant. So it's important to realize that even though your statistical test might show a difference, it might not be enough to be considered practically significant or actually, you know, usable in the real world. Okay, let's move on to chapter 11, which talks about inferences on two samples. So again, we're going to start kind of backwards. We're going to look at this um, table first, which shows us what to do when. So if we're doing um, something for a proportion, we figure out first if it's dependent or independent sampling. So if it's dependent, um, then provided that the samples are obtained randomly and the total number of observations where the outcomes differ is at least 10, then we use the normal distribution with our um, Z to statistic calculated as such, where these numbers are from your contingency table. If you have a proportion with independent sampling, then provided that N times P hat times one minus P hat is at least 10 for each of the samples, and the sample sizes are no more than 5% of their populations, then we use the normal distribution where we take um, Z naught, our test statistic, we take P1 hat minus P2 hat and divide by the square root of P hat times one minus P hat multiplied by one over N1 plus one over N2, where P hat is equal to our successes, X1 and X2, divided by our totals N1 and N2. Now, if we're looking at the mean, if we have independent sampling, then provided that each sample size is greater than 30 or each population is normally distributed, then we calculate our test statistic as follows. T naught is equal to X1 bar minus X2 bar minus mu1 minus mu2, which is just going to be zero. Okay, that's just from your null hypothesis. Mu1 minus mu2 equals zero. And then we divide that by the square root of S1 squared over N1 plus S2 squared over N2. Dependent sampling, provided that each sample size is at least 30 or the differences come from a population that is normally distributed. We use our T distribution. In this case, we take our D bar, which is our differences, our mean of our differences, and subtract our mu of D. And we divide that by S of D, which is our sample standard deviation, over the square root of N. So again, we're not going to do examples for all of these cases. Um, please make sure that you check with your um, your formula sheet and that you know what formulas to use when. There are a lot in this section. Okay, so let's do an example here. Let's test hypotheses regarding two population proportions. So an economist believes that the percentage of urban households with internet access is greater than the percentage of rural households with internet access. So he obtains a random sample of 800 urban households and finds that 338 of them have internet access. He also obtains a random sample of 750 rural households and find that 292 of them have internet access. And we want to test the claim at the alpha equals 0 0.05 level of significance. So first we need to verify that all of our requirements are satisfied. 
samples are simple random samples, which is great. Um, if we take our n1 times our p1 hat multiplied by 1 minus p1 hat, we get 195, which is at least 10. And if we do the same thing for our sample, second sample size, we get 178, which is at least 10 again. Now, it's important to note that you know how to calculate this p1 hat and p2 hat. p1 hat, I think this is for our urban households. We take our 338 people that have internet access and divide it by our 800 total that were surveyed. So we get 0.4225. So that means that 42% of the people in our sample from our urban area do have internet access. And for our P2 hat, we take our 292 rural people with internet access and divide by the total number of surveyed rural individuals, and we get 0 0.3893. So that means that around 39% of our rural households that we surveyed do indeed have internet access. So we want to determine whether the percentage of urban households with internet access is greater than the percent of rural households with internet access. So there are two ways we can set up our... Um, null and all our alternative hypotheses. We'll just look at this first one here. This is more typical. Um, the first one, our null hypothesis, is just that P1 is equal to P2. So we assume that there's no difference between the two. We assume they're the same. Our alternative hypothesis is going to be that P1, those are our urban households, is greater than P2. Step two is to determine your level of significance, which was already given as alpha equals 0.05. The pooled estimate, in order to calculate this, we add up all of our people with internet access, which would be our 338 and our 292, and we divide by our total number of people, which is 800 and 750, and we get 0 0.4065. So you'll see here, all we've done is just plug these numbers into our, um, into our calculator very carefully. We have our um, P1 hat minus our P2 hat divided by the square root of our pooled estimate times one minus the pooled estimate, multiplied by the square root of 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2. And when you do this, again, very, very carefully, this is really easy to screw up um, in your calculator. Just make sure you put lots and lots of parentheses or do it in steps. You get 1.33. Now, because this is a right-tailed test, the p-value is the area that's under the normal distribution to the right of the test statistic 1.33. And if we look this up, we get 0.09. Now, since our p-value is greater than our alpha, we fail to reject H0. So we would say that there is insufficient evidence or there is not sufficient evidence at the alpha equals 0 0.05 level to conclude that per the percentage of urban households with internet access is greater than the percent of rural households with internet access. Okay, let's look at a confidence interval regarding matched pairs data. So the one that we just did, let me find it real quick. Um, this is the... We just um, calculated our test statistic for, let's see, where did it go? Um, for our two population proportions. So that was using our Z, okay? Now we're going to look at matched pairs data. So the following data represents the cost of a one night stay in Hampton Inn Hotels and La Quinta Hotels for a random sample of 10 cities. Now the reason that this is matched pairs is because we're looking at the same 10 cities for each and we're comparing Hampton with La Quinta. And we want to construct a 90% confidence interval. So here's our data. These are um, the expenses that we have for our Hampton and our La Quinta. It's matched pairs since they came from the same 10 cities. Um, First, we calculate all of the differences, okay? They're going to be 24, 53, 100, 40, negative 10, 71, 77, 70, 39, and 50. So all we're doing is we're just taking 129 minus 105, we get 24, and then we do each of the pairs all the way down, so we end up with 10 things. And you can use your um, graphing calculator in order to calculate D bar and S of D, your standard um, deviation for our sample. So our mean difference is 51.4, so $51.40, and our standard deviation is 30.8336. We look at a probability plot for the differences. There aren't any violations, so that one looks good. Box plot, there aren't any asterisks, meaning that there aren't any outliers. So we've already verified that the difference data comes from a population that's approximately normal with no outliers. D bar is 51.4, S of D is 30.883. Um, from table six, with alpha equals 0.1 and nine degrees of freedom, we find our critical value as 1.833. Please make sure you also know how to look up your critical values on your tables or how to find them in your calculator. 
So in order to um, do our uh, lower and upper bounds for our confidence interval, we just plug it into our uh, formula here. So we have 51.4 plus and minus 1.833, that was our um, critical value, multiplied by 30.8336 over the square root of 10 since we had 10 observations. So our lower bound is 33.53 and our upper bound is 69.27. So what we can say is that we are 90% confidence that the mean difference in hotel room prices for Ramada Inn versus La Quinta Inn is between $33.53 and $69.27. Okay, let's look back at the, um, we've done this quarter example before. A researcher wants to know whether state quarters um, had a weight that is more than the traditional quarters. So he randomly selects 18 state quarters, 16 traditional. And here's the data here. To test the claim that the state quarters have a mean weight that is more than traditional, um, we want to use alpha equals 0 0.05. A normal probability plot does indicate the population could be normal. Um, we don't have any outliers here. First thing we want to do is set up our null and all our alternative hypotheses. The null hypothesis is that the two means are the same. The alternative is that our state quarters weigh more than our traditional alpha equals 0 0.05, and so we calculate our test statistic. All of these values have already been calculated. These are our sample means and our sample standard deviations that were calculated either using a graphing calculator or Minitab or Excel. So you just have to take your um, mu1, which is 5.7022, subtract your mu2, which is going to be, um, or sorry, not your mu1 and your mu2, your x bar 1 and your x bar 2. Um, which is going to be 5.6494, so these are our sample means. And then we divide by the square root of our S1 squared, which is 0 0.0497 squared over N1, since we had 18 state quarters. And we take our 0 0.0689 squared divided by our 16 traditional quarters. And once we do all of that, again, very carefully, you get 2.53 as your test statistic. Now, since this is a right-tailed test, the p-value is going to be the area under the t-distribution, so the right of 2.53, and this ends up being 0 0.01. Since this is less than alpha, we do reject the null hypothesis, so we can say that there is sufficient evidence at the alpha equals 0 0.05 level to conclude that the state quarters weigh more than the traditional quarters. Okay, let's take a look back at chapter four because this was done towards the end of class. This is your um, uh, chapter where we describe the relation between two variables. We cre create regression lines. So least squared regression criterion. So the least squares regression line is a line that minimizes the sum of the squared errors or residuals. It minimizes um, the sum of the, basically the vertical distance between the observed values um, and those that are predicted. Sorry, this should be a hat, this should be by hat. And we represent this as the minimum of the sum of the squared residuals. Um, it's always written like this. Y hat is going to be B1X plus B0 where B1 is R times the standard deviation of Y over standard deviation of X from your samples. And B0 is going to be Y bar minus B1 X bar. So you have to find B1 first. Again, there are ways of doing this with your graphing calculator, so please make sure that you're comfortable with that for the exam. Please note that X bar is the sample mean, S of X is the sample standard deviation of the explanatory variable, Y bar is the sample mean, and S of Y is the sample standard deviation, and those are for your response variable Y. This drilling data we've seen um, through many examples over the past few weeks. It talks about the depth at which drilling begins and the time that it takes to drill. And we want to find the least squares regression line, predict the drilling time, and um, figure out if it's above or below average. So this was done using some kind of um, statistical tool like your calculator, something like that. Um, we end up with a y hat equals 0 0.0116 times x plus 5.5273. So if we want to predict for 130 feet, all we do is we plug in 130 for x, and we get 7.035. So the observed drilling time for 130 feet is 6.93 seconds, or sorry, minutes, if we look back. Our predict is, is 7.035. So the drilling time um, is actually a little below what we would predict. 
Now, in order to interpret our slope, we have to think of a couple things. Um, the slope of the regression line is going to be 0 0.0116. So we need to figure out how can we talk about that number um, in the context of the problem. So what this really means is that for every additional foot that we start um, drilling at, the time to drill five feet increases by this amount, 0 0.0116 minutes. If you have something where it's decreasing, it's a negative slope, you're going to have um, the word decreasing in your interpretation here. Now for the interpretation of the y-intercept, the y-intercept of your regression line is 5.5273. So before we go interpreting our y-intercepts, we first have to ask two questions to figure out if it makes sense. So the first question is zero a reasonable value for the explanatory variable? And secondly, do any observations near x equals zero even exist in the data? So a value of zero is reasonable for the drilling data because we're talking about how far down we start to drill. So a value of zero would just mean that we start to begin beginning to drill at the surface of the earth, which is fine. The smallest observation for our data is x equals 35 feet. We can say that's reasonably close to zero. So the interpretation of y intercept is acceptable or reasonable. Okay, now the coefficient of determination. Again, this will be done using some some kind of statistical tool. Um, it's our R squared value. It measures the proportion of the total variation in the response variable that is explained by our least squares regression line. It's always going to be between zero and one. Zero means that the line has no explanatory value. One means that it explains everything. It's perfect. So in our case, um, we have a linear correlation coefficient R, which is 0 0.773. So in order to find R squared, which is our coefficient of determination. We just take our little r, which is our linear correlation coefficient, and we square it. And we end with, with um, 0 0.5975. So that means that 59.75% of the variability in drilling time is explained by the least squares regression line. OK, let's take a look at chapter 12. This was your last chapter. This walks through some additional inferential procedures. So we're going to do um, two of these. We're going to do a goodness of fit test and a chi-square test for independence. There are additional things that are also done um, in this section. I'm trying to remember what exactly. There are some things with expected counts that you'll need to remember um, and uh, confidence and predict prediction intervals for mean responses and individual responses. So it is important that you still know how to do those things, um, but these are just some of the ones that I picked out. There are also some inferences on your least squares regression model in this section. So first of all, let's talk about what a goodness of fit test is, and then let's do an example. So a goodness of fit test is an inferential procedure used to determine whether a frequency distribution follows some specific distribution. So let's go through this example here. A sociologist wishes to determine whether the distribution for the number of years that caregiving grandparents are responsible for their grandchildren is any different today than it was in the year 2000. According to the Census Bureau, in 2000, 22.8% of grandparents were responsible for their grandchildren for less than a year, 23.9% had been responsible for one to two years, 17.6% for three to four years, and 35.7% for five or more years. So that's from the year 2000. That's what we're going to be comparing against. Now, the sociologist randomly selects 1,000 caregiving grandparents um, today and computes the expected number within each category, and we're going to determine if it's any different. So the probabilities um, are as follows. This is from the year 2000 distribution. These are given. Less than a year is 0.228. That was our 22.8% that they gave us. One to two years is 0.239. Three to four is 0.176. And um, at least five is 0.357. So since we're sampling 1,000 um, caregiving grandparents, in order to find our expected counts, all we have to do is take our um, 1,000 and multiply by our uh, percentages that we had from our previous, 
previous experience. So all we have to do is just take 1000 and multiply by our 0.228 and we get 228. So that what that is saying is that out of our 1000 trials, we would expect 228 of the caregiving grandparents to have been caring for their grandchildren for less than a year. Um, and we multiply basically just straight down the same idea except with our individual percentages for each. So we would expect 239 of our 1,000 um, to have been doing caregiving from one to two years, 176 for three to four, and 357 for at least five years. So I want to walk through what the test statistic is, and then we're going to actually calculate it. So OI is going to represent the observed count of category I, EI represents the expected counts of category I, K represents the categories, and N represents the number of independent trials in the experiment. So the formula, our chi-squared test statistic, is going to equal the sum of OI minus EI, so our observed minus our expected, squared, divided by our EI, which is our expected. And we sum that from 1 all the way up to K categories. That will follow approximately a chi-square distribution with k minus 1 degrees of freedom, where k is the number of categories, provided that a couple of things have to be true. The expected frequencies all have to at least be 1, and no more than 20% of them can be less than 5. So again, we have the same setup. Here is our frequencies. So these were the actual um, values that we got when we surveyed the 1,000 um, uh, grandparent caregivers. So 252 had care for less than one year, 255 for one to two, and so on. So step one is to create a null and an alternative hypothesis. So we want to know if the distribution is any different today. So the null hypothesis is that the distribution for the number of years caregiving grandparents are responsible for their grandchildren is actually the same today as it was in the year 2000. And the alternative hypothesis is that the distribution of the, for the number of years that caregiving grandparents are responsible for their grandchildren is different today than it was in the year 2000. So step two determine level of significance alpha equals 0 0.05 and then um, we have the expected and the observed counts. We already calculated expected. This is what was actually observed when we sampled our 1,000 people. So we have number of years, less than one. We observed 252, but we only expected 228, and so on. So in order to, to, to calculate our chi-squared test statistic, we take our observed value, our 252. We subtract our expected, our 228. We square that value. And then we divide by our expected, which is 228. And we do that all the way down for each of our, let's see, we have four categories in this case. And if we do that very carefully, again, per usual in your calculator, you get 6.605. So there are k categories. The p-value is going to be the area under the chi-square distribution with 4 minus 1, which is 3 degrees of freedom. Um, to the right of chi-squared equals 6.605. And if we look up our value, we end up with a p-value of 0 0.09. So since this is greater than the level of significance, which is 0 0.05, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. So we would say that there is insufficient evidence to conclude that the distribution for the number of years caregiving grandparents are responsible for their grandchildren is different today than it was in 2000 at the alpha equals 0 0.05 level. So we cannot conclude that those two things are any different. OK, let's go through a chi-squared test for independence. Now, this is used to determine whether there's an association between a row and a column variable in a contingency table that is constructed from some sample data. The null hypothesis for our chi-squared test for independence is going to be that the variables are not associated or independent. And the alternative hypothesis is going to be that they are associated or dependent. So in order to find expected frequencies, it's not too hard. All you have to do is, well, first, if you don't have row and column totals, you need to go ahead and calculate those. And then you multiply the row total by the column total for each cell and divide by the table total. So if we look at this example we have here, in a poll of 883 males and 893 females, um, they were asked the question, if you could have only one of the following, which would you pick, money, health, or love? The responses are presented in the table below. We want to test the claim that 
gender, and response are independent at the alpha equals 0 0.05 level. So we have 82 of the men who answered money, 446 of the men who answered health, and 355 of the men who answered um, love, 46 of the women answered money, 574 of the women answered health, and 273 of the women answered love. So step one is to set up our null and our alternative hypotheses. So we wanted to know whether gender and response are dependent or independent. So our null hypothesis is that gender and our responses are independent, and the alternative hypothesis is that gender and response are dependent. The second step is um, to just state your level of significance, which is going to be 0 0.05. The expected frequencies were calculated, um, and they're given in parentheses below. Um, so all you would have to do is you'd have to take um, all of the money answers, add these up, all of the health answers, add these up, all of the love answers, add these up. Those would give you your column totals. And then you'd also have to um, total up the men, put that total here, put the total for women over here. And then for this first example, what you would do is you take the total number of men, which is going to be over here, multiply by the total number who answered money, which is going to be your column total down here. And then you divide by your total total, which is the total number of men and women. And you should get 63.5808. And the observed frequencies are shown not in parentheses. Now, to calculate the test statistic, it's just the same idea as the last one. We take what we observed, which is our 82. We subtract what we would expect, which was our 63.5808. We square that difference, and then we divide by our expected, which is 63.5808. And we do this for each of our categories. Um, ignore this L here. That should be, whoops, that should be like a dot, dot, dot. Um, that just indicates that we're doing these for all observations. So you have to do it for all six cells and you will get 36.82. Now, there are you have to um, count how many rows and columns there are. There were two rows, males and females, and three columns, um, the love column, the health column, and the money column. So we find the p-value by using 2 minus 1 times 3 minus 1 degrees of freedom. You subtract 1 from the number of rows, subtract 1 from the number of columns, and then take the product of that. So we get 2 degrees of freedom. The p-value is the area that's under the chi-squared distribution with two degrees of freedom to the right of our chi-squared 36.82, and that is approximately zero. It's a really large test statistic. So since our p-value is less than alpha, we reject the null hypothesis. So we can say that there is sufficient evidence to conclude that gender and response are dependent at the alpha equals 0 0.05 level of significance. So that is it. Please make sure that you also view the midterm um, exam review so that you're fully prepared for your finals.